Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our quarantine studio visit series. I'm Devanna Robidi, the program director. We're joined today by Ann Clark. Anne is a fiber artist in Syracuse, New York. She's the former dean of the Visual and Performing Arts uh, Division of Syracuse University. And she's currently a professor there teaching, teaching uh, lots of different subjects. Um, her main media is fiber art. She's been doing all kinds of very cool projects uh, with intensive knitting processes, felting, um, wearables that double as artworks. And she's currently making a new body of work that will be on display at the Schweinfurth Arts Center in the fall when we reopen. Um, we're very excited to have her join us today. Hi, Anne, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you doing, Devanna? Doing okay. So, Anne, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be showing at the Schweinfurth. So at the Schweinfurth, as you said, I've been working on a series of very large scale wall, uh, rugs uh, that will be hung on the wall, but they, when they go to people's homes, they actually do, in some cases, end up on the floor. Um, on a recent show, they were referred to as monumental textiles. They are uh, 13 feet in height is the one that I just finished. Uh, and. Um, they're largely inspired by taking care of my mother, who will be 100 years old in August and uh, has Alzheimer's. The experience of taking care of her, the folding of time, how she experiences the past in the present. And uh, my process in navigating that is really where a lot of the work comes from. Are there any specific pieces you'd like to highlight with like certain imagery that you are using? Are, are you being more loose with the feelings of the imagery or are there specific meanings or stories or memories that you're addressing in each piece? Well, in a lot of the work, I'm actually using text, uh, letters, letters found, letters from people. Uh, also archival images and texts in a, a piece that I'm working on now. Um, I'm actually using letters from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story and I flipped it so that it's in the reverse. So I, I'm using texts that you may or may not be able to read, layering texts in, in addition to using imagery. So they become these like multi-layered uh, experiences that get flattened. Kind of thinking about your your mother and her experience with Alzheimer's, I find it very interesting that you're looking at memory and thought and connecting those two things. Is it an attempt to connect to her experience or is it um, a way for you to attempt to portray your experience in, in caring for her? It's definitely processing my experience with her um, because it's hard and it's complicated. And there is the, you know, I have one piece that's called Mother and Child, where in the piece I am both the mother and the child, and she is both the mother and the child. So in all of these things and in the experience of caring for her, there's the flipping of a dynamic so, so that our experiences really are mutable, like there is no absolute truth, that everything, her experiences can be seen from a number of different points of view, but that my care of her, I had to let go of what I thought her insistence on right was, or my own insistence on what right was, and to just go with it, uh, so that if she believes that her mother is still alive, insisting that her mother is not still alive is not a productive trajectory to take, right? Mm -hmm. um, because she would be upset. So it's just this dealing with this constantly changing ground and uh, that sort of watershed of a lifetime. I mean, she was born in 1920, the year women got the vote. So the fact that she is fluid through time, I mean, it's like, you know, a PBS special on like the American experience <laughs> from one person's point of view. Um, on any given day, it could be 1945. Yeah. 
it's a little um, Kurt Vonnegut y yeah. to me, where at like Slaughterhouse Five, where you are living in the memory that you are currently in. Yeah. Um, it's almost like you're questioning reality. Um, yeah, definitely. What, you know, what, what is reality? Are our experiences reality? What is a legacy? What do we leave behind? Because in a way, everything that I knew of her uh, is already gone, right? Um, she pretends to know who I am still. So it's very, it's a very trippy kind of sci-fi space. Do you feel more connected to the people who are alive in her mind through those? Oh, yeah, movies? definitely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Because a lot of them, right? She was, I mean, she was 41 when I'm, I'm 60 and she's going to be 100. Um, a lot of these people I never knew. I was, they like predated me. Mm -hmm. And so rather than sort of reading an artifact of a letter or something, because they are alive to her, they, she, she is sharing information about them in a very different way. You know, it'd be like me at the end of the day. Oh, I was online with Javanna is a very different thing than somebody saying, looking at my appointment book and saying, oh, at 2.30, you were online with Javanna. Like it's that difference mm -hmm. because they are real to her. They are alive again. It happened. It's not, oh, my great aunt Tilly lived in 1950. It's like, yeah she's living right now there. Hi, how are you? You know, so it's, it's, it is. Uh, they, so the, uh, it is history coming to life, which in this like really super trippy way sometimes turns into some kind of weird, like, okay, the birds are singing, like in the pots, like it, it can even become this kind of Disney, like, mm -hmm. thing. like anything is possible in this space. Up is down. Dead is alive. Alive is not entirely alive. It's very, it's a very strange space. Making these rugs, which are, they're foundational. They're, they are what I stand on. So, you know, the idea of making something that literally I can stand on that makes manifest what I am experiencing in that truly sort of real material way. So there's a kind of a conjuring of comfort there, like mm -hmm. an affirmation through the work because I, I'm a, I, I am it in terms of her care, uh, in addition to some just angels of, uh, of elder sitters over the years. But to situate myself is the sort of starting point, to situate myself in these sort of idea pools of these rugs. Um, you sort of hit at my next question of, of why rugs. It seems that you keep going back to it needing to be uh, a, some kind of function. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see why it's important to you in this series. But overall, as you look through your work, do you see yourself returning to between those two worlds? And what do you think about that? I love when I'm making things that can live within people's lives but that choice is there that invitation is there so and i love to reference it i mean i love it as an idea that when you're looking at something on a wall so if the rug is on the wall and somebody chooses to hang it as art and not put it on the floor um that it's still it's still domestic it's still referencing function and use and home and touch and hand right the thing about textiles for me is there's, you know, sure, there's the imaging, there's the choices, there's the color, uh, and there's the hand, right? There's how it, how it feels, it's how, you, how when you look at it, it invokes how it feels, that there's an invitation to touch, and the things I make feel, literally feel good. Uh, so I like to break down that space of whether it's on the wall or on the floor, is that yeah you can lean against it you can touch it it's about it's about touching it it's that like literally getting your hands into it uh so i i do i just i i i love function use you know uh it, it, it's also this kind of like work ethic that i like the work to sort of invoke that it works, that it's working in life, that all of these ideas, like in this series about my mother, it's about, there's a component of work 
uh, and how the piece works and how I work and how I'm working with her and kind of, I don't think it's because I'm a kid of depression era parents, but um, <laughs> you know, the work, the w work matters. Um, and it seems to me that you are also drawn to these really intensive processes. I am the same way. I will find a process that is easy until I get it and then I overcomplicate it. Talk a little bit about that. You, you mentioned the work. Uh, why is that important to you to overwork things to the point of being crazy? Do you feel crazy? <laughs> I think I, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, sometimes I do. I mean, when I step back and say, holy cow, because it's absolutely the case. I mean, knitting is incredibly simple, right? Mm -hmm. And no matter what I engage, I'm always upping the ante. But I think that that's the part of, and I think that's the part of, part of my process that's about sort of getting interested in the potential of things that I haven't figured out yet. So it's within a, you know, so my work is, exists arguably in a very narrow range, like twilight, like I'm just knitting, right? So I've narrowed the parameters. I'm not using other materials. I'm not doing the infinite number of things that could be done. But within that narrow range, I want to continue to explore the full potential and scale and complexity is inevitably where I go. You know, it's in and of itself, the making and solving the problems of making um, fascinate me. And the, you know, the infinite little choices of color shifts as I go through. And where do I tack this down? And where do I tack that down? And, and uh, uh, will this, what's my maximum scale size for the current equipment I have? Um, yeah, so I always have all of those. And I also have these goals of, you know, a zero waste studio. So I'm using everything. So I, I, I think it just, uh, I mean, part of it's almost like a game, but it, it, it's fully engaging. But I do think that there is in this work about my mother and the re one of the reasons why I'm increasing the scale is to, your, to that point of the progression is slow. So I've had to, and this everything is sort of this switchback in this work is that by working bigger i've i sort of i've had to slow down to make different choices and plan ahead and slowing down has become like not having i need to do th three feet in a day like if i can do on one panel one foot that's progress so they take a lot of time and if i rush i make mistakes like I, it's, I make it sort of specific enough that I have to, I have to pay attention and I have to slow down, yeah. which is, which is hard, hard for me to slow down. Um, can you kind of show us around your studio a little bit? If you can I turn can. the camera. Um, I can. A tour. So part of my work here, I work, I have something on the knitting machine right now. And those are that's where all of my yarns are. And I think you see my dog, Beatrice. There's my little studio dog. Uh, I'm gonna come around the corner here. And so this is a piece that I'm working on right now. So this is when, before it's been washed and processed. So these are the first four panels of this piece that's about my twin sister and me and our mother. And so I can flip for the textile people. So when, so it really looks like, you know, like a knit. And I wash it and I can unroll this. And so this right here, so this, you can see this is the back of a rug that used to look like that. So this gets, they get washed and processed so that they end up having a very different hand that doesn't look like it's knit at all. Um, so it's hard with the camera. I have some pieces over there. Fabrics, these are some eyes. And I have a little space down here in the 
in the staircase where I have some pieces and that's my sort of chalkboard wall for setting up and planning. And Beatrice again. <laughs> and so that's the studio. So I'm pretty much surrounded by images. I'm surrounded by color. I'm a color junkie. Oh, I love your studio space. It's gorgeous. I love your studio dog. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, one thing we haven't talked about are the eyes. Yeah, so the eyes really were, uh, uh, came out of, again, taking care of my mother and having these, um, this, it's a science fiction kind of thing, like a Jules Verne almost, uh, that in talking to her, you know, she will believe that her brother has just come in or other individuals who are whole people who have come back to life for her. They haven't come back to life for me. So it just started to feel like almost like, you know, like a portal in a, you know, weird submarine where the, the lens of a window amplifies something. So I'm, it's like, that's what it feels like is these people sort of peeping into my life and my mother's life and she sees them as one thing and I see them as this sort of freakish intrusion of time that's totally real to her which I have to honor and so you get the point so that the so it really became this like these uh intrusions from the past uh um becoming real but not real well and Thank you so much for inviting us into your studio. And we are so looking forward to your exhibit. Yeah. And I can't wait to see, um, I've, I've seen a lot of them in person already and I encourage everyone to, to come see it when it's up. They're fabulous and we're very excited to have Anne's work at the Schweinfurth. And thank you for inviting us into your studio. Um, guys, you can check out more of Anne's work on her website, anneclarkart.com. Um, and thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, Devanna. Thank you so much.